All right. Um, I'm Julie Downen, and I'm going to talk about the role of pharmacy and antimicrobial stewardship. So I'm really going to build on the concepts that Dr. Sundarajan just discussed. Um, certainly, she covered this um, very well in her presentation, um, so I'll briefly go through this, um, but certainly we see there's an opportunity to improve antibiotic use um, because there's 30% of antibiotic use is unnecessary or uh, inappropriate within the hospital. Um, certainly, um, antibiotic use um, contributes to C. diff and antibiotic resistance, and she touched on this beautifully that antibiotic use is both a medication and patient safety issue. Um, certainly, um, half of our patients receive an antibiotic for at least one day during um, an average hospital stay, with the most common indication being a lung infection. Um, I will briefly touch on this, but the benefits of stewardship include um, improved patient outcomes. Um, in one of the projects I'm going to share, we saw um, improved time to target therapy. Um, certainly, we can also see that in terms of length of stays as well. And um, we want to reduce those adverse events. Um, improve rates of antibiotic susceptibilities uh, uh, to antibiotics, um, and then optimize the resource uh, utilization across the continuum of care. Um, she also hit on the antimicrobial stewardship structure. Um, this is uh, how our committee looks here. And I think it's really important, um, you know, for pharmacy to do many of the things that we do within the hospital. We collaborate with this team, but we also need the support and buy-in of all these members to be successful. Again, she um, also talked about the um, IDSA guidelines for antibiotic stewardship. So I'm gonna drill down on each of these interventions and how um, pharmacists play a role uh, in these interventions. So when we talk about prospective audit and feedback, um, both strategies are used at our hospital in Springfield. Um, we use them um, in, differently though. So when we look at prospective audit and feedback, um, that's kind of my favorite of these two, to be honest. Um, in this, um, in this intervention, it allows providers to the autonomy to choose the uh, appropriate antibiotics for their patient, but um, certainly it allows pharmacy then to engage um, in interventions um, after antibiotics are, are prescribed. And this is really a great um, intervention because it provides education both for um, you know, our prescribers as well as our pharmacists. Um, and there's great opportunity for de-escalation and duration of therapy. And, we do this uh, in a number of ways. So uh, the first thing that we have um, at our institution is we use a, an external monitoring system called Theradoc and it takes our, our data, our patient information, um, and we set alerts for things that we want this program to identify about our patients. So for instance, we may have a patient who's been on antimicrobial therapy for 48 to 72 hours with no positive cultures. Um, and so this system, flags those patients for us. And then those are the patients that we then um, review their charts and then provide um, interventions as needed. But you can imagine this is pretty labor intensive um, and success depends on the delivery method um, of feedback. And I can't echo that enough. Um, I always prefer to have a conversation, particularly face-to-face -face, um, versus over the phone or um, you know through some secure messaging. So and those are the most effective ways to provide um, these interventions and feedback. Certainly, we also do prior authorization. Um, so um, this is an, an uh, antibiotic intervention strategy requiring clinicians to get approval prior to using it. Um, and it uh, decreases unnecessary or inappropriate antibiotic use and is a cost containment strategy as well. But again, um, it can impact um, therapy, um, you know, initiation as well. It's again, intensive. So we've actually had some success in this area as well. Um, a number of years ago, uh, we targeted erdipenem, for instance, and we had really a, a broad use of that, um, including a fair amount of usage in our um, surgical arena. And so we really narrowed in, um, provided a lot of feedback to our surgeons, and we're able to really carve out that utilization um, within that area. And we've really done a nice job of decreasing our use and being able to conserve that um, important antimicrobial for the inf infections that it is necessary for. 
Um, some other interventions, um, to we provide facility specific clinical practice guidelines. So we do that. Um, we create these based on the, you know, the evidence that's out there. Um, we have them for pneumonia, UTI, skin and soft tissue infections. And I bolded a couple of these because um, within the last year, we've gotten much more creative um, and enhanced those, um, what we call power plans or order sets. And this is just a screenshot of what we've done. So um, we implemented a skin and soft tissue infection protocol. So um, in this top box here, um, we can see that um, that's just like the, the plan itself. But then within that, we have antibiotic options and things like that. But what we've attached to it um, is this pathway. And so this pathway really expands on the information that's provided in the power plan. And so it gives additional information such as pathogens, um, when to obtain cultures, guidance on durations of therapy, if they're not quite sure what their duration is initially, and then opportunities for oral step-down therapy as well. Um, uh, we talked about formulary restriction. I mentioned it about um, ertapenem. So we have a number of agents that we restrict or try to limit use. Um, typically, these are some of your newer agents. Um, we want to just conserve um, their spectrum or their susceptibility. Um, and so we do it in one of two ways. Um, one, we on the left-hand side, you can see we have a drop-down menu. Um, so this way, um, we filter that drop-down menu with just the approved um, indications for that antimicrobial. Um, so it's also a great communication method too for all providers as well as pharmacy staff to see this anti antibiotic indication documented. And then the other way we do it is through um, what we call conditional logic. So we've built forms within our EHR. And so if the patient meets the criteria uh, for uh, the antimicrobial, then um, it will launch the order for providers. Automatic IV to PO conversion. This is a project I ran a number of years ago. Um, and these are just the antimicrobials that are included within the IV to PO conversion, uh, the automatic IV to PO conversion. Um, but this is um, executed by our pharmacy staff. Um, we have a dynamic work list that actually um, within the EHR identifies patients who are on these medications IV, but also have a general diet. So that's not a shoe in that, yep, we're gonna automatically convert this patient, um, but it, it identifies the patient for us to then review. And I can tell you with this project, um, you know, we really did see um, a significant um, impact to length of stay. Um, it, it did decrease length of stay. Um, a subsequent um, outcome, although not our primary focus, was a decrease in cost, as you can imagine, if you convert from IV to oral therapy. Uh, when we're talking about dose optimization, um, there's a couple strategies that we utilize. We have our pharmacokinetics policy. So this is um, something where pharmacy can dose um, both vancomycin and aminoglycosides, to name a few, in order to optimize therapy. Um, we're in the midst of transitioning to AUC to MIC based dosing um, with the end goal of um, dosing all of our vancomycin. So that, that should be, um, we should be able to do that in the next couple of months. And um, the other strategy we use um, is to change how we infuse drugs. So certainly Piperacil and Tazobactam can be given over 30 minutes or over four hours. And we um, implemented an extended infusion policy a number of years ago so that we can maximize that time above the MIC um, for this medication. Um, we're also going to be um, implementing it with meropenem shortly. As Dr. Sundarishan talked about pre-pen testing, this is another initiative that came out of, um, you know, pharmacy and collaboration with our um, ID team. Um, but we know that hospitalized patients oftentimes um, have uh, penicillin allergies or beta-lactam allergies, and we know that 10 to 20 percent of patients report having a penicillin allergy, but the true incidence of anaphylaxis is relatively low. Um, but we know even penicillin or beta-lactam allergic patients receive more vancomycin, fluoroquinolones, and clindamycin, subsequently resulting in longer length of stays, more multi-drug resistant pathogens that then result in increased healthcare costs. So the penicillin skin testing process is a four-step process um, that begins with a patient interview, and it's pretty extensive. So we not only ask the patient about their, their allergy history, um, but we, we introduce antibiotics. Hey, have you ever used this one or that one? Um, and we use both brand and generic names um, just in terms of recognition. And um, we do extensive chart reviews um, and external um, 
prescriptions in our system, um, in any system we have. Um, from there, if the patient still uh, requires a penicillin skin test, um, we'll do a puncture test followed by an intradermal test and then an oral IV oral or IV challenge. I will say that anytime during um, the testing process, if they don't pass that step, we immediately stop testing um, and um, don't proceed on uh, with the further steps. And the other thing I wanted to mention um, is that in our patient interview process, um, I would say we of the patients we get asked to do a pre-pen test on, we actually only end up testing, I would say 25 to 30% of patients. Because when we do this extensive review and interview, um, we oftentimes find that they can actually tolerate a beta-lactam. The next thing I wanted to share was um, the Varagene um, blood panel. So a number of years ago, um, this we implemented the Varagene blood panel, um, and it's a rapid blood culture test that we run on our first set of positive blood cultures. Um, based on the gram stain, um, the Varagene will be set, assuming the machine's available and everything works perfectly, it's set immediately. We can see a turnaround time in about two to three hours, depending on the organism. Um, whenever we set the Varagene, though, we certainly always run routine sensitivities and um, testing may be repeated every three days on appropriate cultures. Um, on the bottom of the screen, you can see that um, there's uh, just a chart for guidance. So if you have a resistance mechanism pop up based on the organism, we give antibiotic recommendations. But certainly um, what's not on this chart is that if there's not a resistance marker, that is also an opportunity for de-escalation. And so we also had some project work done around this as well. And what we found um, is once we implemented the Varagene blood um, panel on our gram negatives, um, we saw a statistically significant decrease in time to target therapy, and it was over a day. Um, we did see some other positive results, um, although not statistically significant, um, but we did see a decrease in our 30-day um, readmission rate as well. Uh, the other thing that we do um, is pharmacists are able to um, order MRSA nasal PCRs um, to enable early de-escalation of empiric vancomycin or linazolid uh, in the treatment of pneumonia. So we know that um, if our PCR comes back, well, first we know that MRSA pneumonia um, is not um, very common, um, but then if when we um, get these negative results back, we also know that, um, that it's likely not present, so then we can de-escalate therapy. And so um, I share this graph of vancomycin utilization um, over the past couple of years to see the impact of this. So um, to, be, to kind of give you a timeline, um, we actually went live with our MRSA nasal PCR screen at the end of 2019, so in, in December. Um, you can obviously see we didn't really see the true, um, you know, uh, uh, impact of, of that. Um, actually, we saw an increase in our vancomycin utilization. Um, but I will highlight in early 2020 is when COVID began. Um, so it was a little bit more challenging to get that um, implemented. But over time, we've really seen a nice a decrease in our vancomycin utilization as uh, shown here. Um, antibiotic timeouts. So, you know, I think this is um, important for uh, providers as well as our pharmacy staff. So um, again, we use that Theradoc, um, that Theradoc program um, that you know highlights um, patients for us to review. But certainly, um, you know, every time I'm in a chart, and I encourage you know all of our pharmacists to follow this. Um, you know, does the patient have an infection? Do they need antibiotics? Are they on the right antibiotics, the right dose, or correct route? Can we de-escalate? And what is our expected or anticipated duration of therapy? So although a timeout typically occurs somewhere 40, 48 to 72 hours, that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, ask these same questions on a day-to-day -day basis. So every time antibiotics are prescribed, you know, recommend um, the appropriate cultures before the antibiotics are started. Make sure we know our indication dose and expected duration are specified in the record. That really helps um, pharmacy staff or, you know, the whole patient care team be on, on board with what the plan is for the antibiotics and continue to reassess whether it be at 48 or 72 hours um, and adjust those antibiotics as if necessary. And I just wanted to conclude with this quote that good antibiotic stewardship is a practice that ensures the optimal selection, dose, and duration of an antimicrobial therapy that leads to the best clinical outcome for the treatment or prevention of an infection while producing the fewest toxic effects and the lowest risk for subsequent uh, resistance.